This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look at the top stories in the coming week from our Daybreak anchors all around the world. Straight ahead on the program, a look at more economic data in the U.S. that may impact Fed policy moving forward. I'm Tom Busby in New York. I'm Stephen Carroll in London, where we're thinking about the future of healthcare as we look ahead to the WHO's World Health Assembly in Geneva. I'm Doug Krisner, looking ahead to the trilateral meeting between Japan, South Korea and China. That's all straight ahead on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend on Bloomberg 1130 New York, Bloomberg 991 Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 1061 Boston, Bloomberg 960 San Francisco, DAB Digital Radio London, Sirius XM 119, and around the world on BloombergRadio.com and via the Bloomberg Business app. Good day to you. I'm Tom Busby, and we begin today's program with some key economic data out this week in the U.S. We'll get the first quarter GDP, a second look at the GDP, and also core PCE numbers for April. What could this data mean for Fed policy moving forward? Well, for more, we're joined by Stuart Paul, U.S. economist with Bloomberg Economics. Now, we got a welcome surprise on April CPI a few weeks back. What are you expecting to see this week? The core PCE inflation measure is going to show some cooling in price inflation. We're expecting to see headline PCE inflation of just 0.2% during the month. And that's going to allow the annual measure of PCE inflation to slow to about 2.6% from 2.7% in March. The Fed's preferred measure is core PCE inflation and is likely to register just about a quarter of 1% during the month. Most of the consensus is expecting about 0.3. We're a touch below that. That's going to hold the annual measure of core inflation at 2.8%, holding steady between March and April. And it's a, a really slow, gradual pace of disinflation that we're seeing. And some of that in April is due to the cooling labor market, slowing personal income growth, and slowing spending growth all of which we'll see on Friday in the Personal Income and Outlays Report. All right, so people are pulling back. Is it all levels of consumer, or is it mostly just lower end? Because it, you, you get an, a, a reservation in a restaurant in New York, there is, it's full. That's right. It does appear that it is mostly at the lower end. We see folks are focusing a bit more on spending on consumer staples and some of the necessities. They are reining in their spending a little bit on some of the more discretionary items. If you look at retail sales, for example, which we saw earlier this month, basically the entire increase in spending that we saw on clothing was just an increase in prices. And if that's downstream of retailers doing a good job of managing their inventories rather than consumers just going out and spending more, uh, it is indicative of a bit more of uh, some belt tightening on the part of consumers. Oh, yeah. And we saw that from Walmart, which lowered prices in the first quarter and sales rose. And they say more consumers who don't normally shop here come in and now Target doing the same thing. And these are, are you know, those two companies account for about one third of all the groceries sold in the U.S. So it's not a small thing. That's right. There are some folks who are rotating from higher end retailers to some of those uh, lower end retailers. They are doing a little bit of bargain hunting out there and they are focusing more on those consumer staples as opposed to discretionary spending. We would expect to see folks like Walmart and Target benefiting as opposed to higher end retailers and, and folks that are selling more interest sensitive durable goods, for example. Now, how about gasoline? And, and I ask because here we're coming into the summer season. We get the summer blends. Usually prices go up for gasoline, not only because of demand, but the more expensive way that they have to fabricate that summer blend. What do you expect to see there? Because that affects everybody. Poor, rich, doesn't matter. That's right. So we are expecting to see gases, uh, gas price lean rising in line with c typical seasonal factors. Gasoline prices are downstream from global energy prices, and there's very little that folks can do to combat rising global energy prices. Fortunately, there's very little geopolitical risk premium, despite there being some conflict in the Middle East. And if we think about it in terms of consumer spending on a real basis, spending on gasoline is very, very steady once you adjust for fluctuations in uh, gasoline prices. So, again, like you say, it is the sort of thing that affects everybody. It does strip out the ability of consumers to spend more on other more discretionary categories. 
And perhaps that's part of the reason why we're seeing consumers rotating away from the more interest sensitive, the more discretionary spending categories. Now, in April for the CPI, we got a nice surprise. Uh, after three months this year of inflation going higher, we got a little pullback. Uh, one month, though, not a pattern, not a pattern. But it sounds like you're expecting, uh, you know, the PCE to be pretty good. W- what does that mean? And and do you think we're maybe turning a corner? Or do you think the Fed is hoping we're turning a corner? The timing really matters here, right? So these are all April figures. And we did see that Q1 was quite hot. It was hot for prices. It was hot for economic growth. We'll get some revisions to the Q1 GDP numbers coming up this week. But all things considered, domestic economic activity was really strong through March. As we made the transition into April, we started seeing the economy and prices losing some of that momentum. As you say, it's not a pattern. We did hear a lot of Fed speak this week that completely took a a summer rate cut either in June (laughs) coming up or in July off the table. Markets are currently pricing in just two rate cuts this year. But I think that, if anything, risk probably skews to maybe just having one 25 basis point cut this year, perhaps just in December, uh, but very likely in the fourth quarter. So what does it mean? It means that we are seeing some of the waning momentum that the Fed has been looking for to gain confidence that prices will sustainably go towards that 2% inflation target. But waning momentum isn't enough. There needs to be a more persistent more convincing uh, slide towards that 2% inflation target. And uh, we're nowhere near that right now. But And the Fed does meet, uh, let's see, June 11th and 12th, so that's coming up soon. Obviously, nobody, especially after what we heard last week from pretty much every single Fed governor, Fed president, Fed official, that don't expect a rate cut anytime soon. That's right. Even in the June meeting, we're going to get the new summary of economic projections, commonly referred to as the dot plot. Uh, In the previous dot plot from March, Fed officials, the median Fed official, was expecting to see 75 basis points of cuts this year. We expect that the June dot plot is going to show just 50 basis points of cut this year. And so not only are we not going to see a cut coming up, but they're going to push out expectations for any cuts this year. Well, our thanks to Stuart Paul, U.S. economist with Bloomberg Economics. Next week, computer services giants Dell and HP report their latest quarterly results, just as both make a huge push into hardware infused with artificial intelligence technology. Now, for more on those companies and what to expect next, we're joined by Wu Jin Ho, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst. Well, Wu Jin, before we get into the newest uh, proclamations from Dell, HP, what role did artificial intelligence play in the upcoming earnings, if at all? And what are you expecting to see in those earnings? Well, if, if we think about AI, artificial intelligence, um, there's two aspects for both Dell and HP. Uh, Dell has AI PCs as well as HP, and that's still a, a fairly new category for both of those uh, those companies. And But you also have AI servers, and Dell has much more exposure to AI servers, and that's already driving growth momentum for Dell, and I expect it to drive more momentum going forward. Ah, okay. So they're they're, they're a little ahead of the game, but this past week, we learned from Dell at one of their showcases that uh, it it looks like they're almost starting over with these AI PCs and Mm -hmm. laptops, and they're promising a whole new world. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, I mean, if if you think about AI PCs, it's still a a fairly new category, as I said. Uh, What what you're seeing with AI PCs is that you're you're getting new chips that have neural processor units, which essentially enables the AI functions on the PCs. Uh, Traditionally, what uh, AI applications run on are, are graphic processors, but they're less efficient on the PC. And Intel, Qualcomm, AMD, they are all announcing or have announced new chips with these NPUs. And uh, the number that we expect this year is roughly about um, 40 million to 50 million units of AI PCs that Dell as well as HPE will participate in. And and these uh, processors, these uh, semiconductor makers, have made deals with just about everybody in the, in the you know it seems. Yeah, one of the things that uh, Dell said uh, at their event is that they expect every PC will be an AI enabled PC, right? So look beyond the forty million this year or forty or fifty million this year, 
I'm forecasting roughly around 267 million PCs in total next year. I wouldn't be surprised that there will be some sort of AI enablement for roughly a, a, a third or a half of the PCs that are out there. Now, this an almost exponential leap into AI. Is this what's going to really jumpstart sales of hardware? And you talked about servers, mm -hmm. but I mean, some of these Dell, they saw huge gains during the pandemic, and then things have slacked off. HP, you know, has been almost an also ran for a little bit here, but is this going to really boost sales? So there are two aspects of sales, right? Unit volume growth and ASP growth, okay. right? And then if we think about it from a unit volume perspective, this year, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I do think uh, both companies are forecasting roughly low single-digit growth in terms of uh, PC, in terms of the PC market. I don't think that's going to change when they report uh, earnings later this week. Now, in terms of ASPs, I'll, I'll tell you what, what was very interesting. The Apple iPad event, right? They introduced a new chip that was AI-enabled. Their own chip, right? Their own chip yeah. that was AI-enabled. There was no ASP boost to the new iPad Pro. What that tells me that the basic PC that is AI enabled may not get an ASP boost. That being said, um, what we're about roughly four years into coming out of COVID right now, or the beginning of COVID. The average refresh cycle for the corporate PC is roughly four to five years. We're actually in the early cusp of the necessary refresh cycle, number one. And there's a bigger catalyst that's coming in, in uh, later this year and early next year, the Windows 11 upgrade cycle. And I, I actually think 2025 PC volumes are going to be much stronger than 2024. Uh, uh, corporate, schools, consumer, everybody? Um, corporates, predominantly, right? Um, I, I think uh, the enthusiasts on, on the consumer side will really lean into the AI PC. Schools, they're, they're going to take a while. <laughs> yeah, right? that's, a, that's a big expenditure. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, our thanks to Wu Jin Ho, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, a look at the global health landscape ahead of the 77th World Health Assembly in Geneva. I'm Tom Busby, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, our global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. I'm Tom Busby in New York. Up later in our program, a look ahead to the trilateral meeting between China, Japan, and South Korea and what it means for their relationships moving forward. But first, since COVID-19, healthcare has become even more of a big business. This past March, Danish drug maker Novo Nordisk became Europe's most valuable company, overtaking LVMH thanks to its wonder drugs, weight loss medicines, Ozempic and Wegovy. And this week is the 77th World Health Assembly, where reconciling the worlds of business and healthcare will be just one topic on the agenda. For more, let's go to London and bring in Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor Stephen Carroll. Tom, the World Health Assembly is the decision-making body of the World Health Organization and delegates from the WHO's member states will be gathering in Geneva in the coming days with some key issues in mind. They're aiming to improve access to treatment around the world with a key ambition to see one billion more people benefit from universal health coverage. Reaching every corner of the world with healthcare is no easy feat, though, and often requires the use of complementary tools. It's something Nisa Leung, managing partner at Chiming Venture Partners, has been discussing at this year's Qatar Economic Forum. I've been involved with um, healthcare investment for the last 18 years, and it's great to see the development we've seen in the last um, you know, 15, 20 years and, and so forth. At the beginning, uh, we would be looking at potentially areas that you know, when we first started in, um, in China and investing in areas where there's no Medtronic, there's no Pfizer and whatnot, so how do we provide basic services and care and drugs and devices to China? And as we continue to grow in the last 10 years, we started looking at innovation from all over the world. And we think about how do we use technology? How do we use the next um, dimensions of life science tools and whatnot? to actually help our research institutions to develop beyond. So, you know, we are very, one of the early investors in AI drug discovery, yeah. uh, starting with um, the investment in Schrodinger in New York. And um, we were also angel investor in recursion out of Salt Lake City. 
um, and then followed by in silico and so forth. So, you know, what's really interesting is now we're able to use AI to identify target and use AI to develop molecular structure. And now we have drugs in phase two clinical in US uh, with a pipeline of another 13 drugs in the pipeline, you know, focused on unmet medical needs that previously we were not able to develop on our own. So now beyond that, we've actually started looking into, and we recently invested in uh, a company we're thinking, since we have so many targets coming out from AI, assets and assets, we can't continue to rely on animal studies. That would be the bottleneck. So how can we use technology to combat that? So we recently invested in a spin-off from Harvard Medical um, School, WIST Institute, organs on the chip. So every chip is a different organ, including liver, that would test toxicity and so forth. So we're always thinking 5, 10, 20 years from now, what do we need? That was Nisa Leung there from Qiming Venture Partners speaking. Now, the pharmaceutical giants are key to developing and rolling out new medical treatments. Some of the biggest names in the sector have been boosted by blockbuster weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Wegovy. But others like AstraZeneca are setting ambitious growth targets too. They want to double sales by 2030. In recent days, AstraZeneca's CFO, Arathana Saran, spoke to Bloomberg. The breadth and scope of our medicines is truly incredible, and it ranges everything from oncology and rare diseases to the medicines in biopharma for metabolic disorders, as well as respiratory. And the growth that we anticipate is both from existing products, as well as the 20 new medicines that we expect to launch by 2030. Oncology clearly absolutely front and center. As we work our way through this period, How big is oncology going to be for AstraZeneca as we get to the end of this period? How big a slice of the pie is oncology going to represent? You know, oncology continues to grow very strongly. Today, oncology is about 40% of the business, and we expect very strong uh, double-digit growth in oncology, uh, both in uh, new medicines as well as our existing medicines and new indications for those medicines. Overall, we have over 120 phase two and three studies uh, going on for our medicines. And again, we're working on a whole bunch of new medicines that you'll hear about today. Arathna, talk to us a little bit about your manufacturing plans here. Uh, Recently, there have been investments in facilities in Dunkirk, Singapore, Liverpool, even Maryland as well. In light of some of the kind of crackdown that U.S. regulatory authorities are putting in terms of where supply chains extend into Asia, how is AstraZeneca tackling that manufacturing story? So our manufacturing investments are very strategic. Um, They are aligned very much with the new modalities and the new technologies that we have in our pipeline. So the announcement, for example, in Maryland uh, is for cell therapy products, which we see as sort of a completely new modality that will uh, change how cancer care and autoimmune diseases are treated. What we announced in Singapore is for antibody drug conjugates. We expect that antibody drug conjugates will replace traditional chemotherapy over the next decade. And so we're making these investments ahead of what we see coming in our pipeline because we know that these medicines have the potential to be very large medicines. That's Arathana Saran from AstraZeneca there speaking to our colleagues on Bloomberg Television. Those conversations are helping to set the industry context for the upcoming World Health Assembly. And our health reporter Ashley Furlong has been telling me about how the gathering works. So usually it's it's all the countries of the World Health um, Organization, um, which really represents the entire globe coming together to take decisions that should sort of set the scene for, um, uh, you know, how to uh, sort of advance, uh, you know, global health aims uh, for the coming year. This year, it's all about the pandemic treaty. And this is quite a controversial um, uh, potential agreement that's still being negotiated. And we're obviously really, you know, on the cusp of the, the actual assembly. The agreement would sort of set out how countries could be better prepared for the next pandemic. And it includes things, potential provisions, uh, such as, you know, how to share vaccines more equitably next time, or, um, you know, how to, um, uh, you know, ensure that intellectual property rights provisions related to these, these medicines enable them to be better shared. But it ha- agreement hasn't actually been reached um, reached yet. Uh, so that that is really what everyone's um, waiting to see if we will reach agreement next week. 
are these discussions also, do they look backwards at what went wrong, for example, during COVID to try and bring lessons from them? Or is this sort of a, a more forward looking event? Definitely. So it's, it is looking back It's saying what went wrong and included in the in the draft that's that's currently being discussed are many things that would that countries believe would fix the mistakes that, that happened in the past. For example, it's things such as when you find viruses in a country, you know, how you share that really quickly with other countries. Um, and then how drug makers would be able to take those virus sequences and produce medicines quickly. But a lot of it's really controversial because, um, you know, it would require drug makers potentially then to add certain amounts of those products that they make with the World Health Organization. Um, and countries need to agree to share these products, um, you know, in a, in a more equitable way. And I think that, you know, this is this has become highly controversial. And Almost separately to that, commentators, particularly right-wing commentators in the US and the UK, have led quite a vocal campaign against the pandemic treaty, claiming that it would violate country sovereignty um, and give the WHO you know, increased powers that they believe it shouldn't have. Um, the World Health Organization says that, you know, that's that's not the case, that this is an agreement by countries um, and that the countries are pushing for it. But that sort of, um, I suppose, muddied the waters in a sense and, and, and made this sort of an even more controversial um, document. How much is the industry involved in these discussions? You know, drug makers, of course, very much in focus during COVID, but now the focus is you know, been largely in recent months on things like the rise of, of weight loss drugs or drugs that aid weight loss for treating diabetes, the likes of Ozempic. I think drug makers are following it very closely um, and uh, they're represented in the discussions by the International Pharma uh, Lobby Group. Uh, you know, and they, I think, have supporters, um, you know, on their side in the, in, in, in the form of sort of countries like the UK and the US who, um, you, you know, are pushing for similar provisions. For example, you know, drug makers uh, are against provisions that might force them to share intellectual property rights, uh, you know, related to their products. Um, and they're also concerned about, you know, the, there's sort of this argument for sort of a quid pro quo. If you find a genetic sequence of a, a virus and then you want you, a country wants to share it globally, you know, what should that country get back in in, in sort of uh, return for that? And drug makers are, are are broadly sort of, you know, against the idea that there should be that sort of direct relationship between sharing virus sequences and then and then countries getting something back. So I think they're, they're very much involved, obviously. Um, you know, there's quite a small chance that this agreement actually might be reached in time. So I suppose that, you know, there's sort of less concern that some of these very controversial provisions might actually be included in the end. Where, I suppose, are the biggest roadblocks in in arriving at that agreement? Is it a case of countries lobbying for their own particular interests or is it on the kind of the issues themselves? It's, I think, the issues themselves, because they they require, you know, they, they, they would, this would be an agreement that then would be, you know, sort of for the foreseeable future, for any pandemic in the future. So, you know, it's making these decisions as, you know, it's not, it's not something that countries do lightly. And, uh, you know, international treaties are quite rare. As, as diplomats negotiating this would argue, you know, the timelines that they've had, which has just been a few years since the end of the pandemic, it, you know, it actually, it's actually pretty short, even though it might seem quite long, um, you know, in, in, in negotiating international treaties. I think because they're such, you know, controversial issues, and I suppose there's no current pandemic going on that's sort of putting the pressure on them, that's made it quite difficult to reach that agreement. And countries, some countries are pushing for more time to um, to to conclude the negotiations and potentially, you know, saying, should we delay this to the next um, World Health Assembly, which would be next year, obviously, or, or potentially later this year. So there's still, uh, you know, uncertainty about when this, when this would actually um, be agreed. Okay, so that that the pandemic agreement, uh, as you've outlined, a very key focus of the discuss these discussions. Anything else you're going to be watching out for uh, in the conversations happening in Geneva? I think that will really be key. Um, uh, but I suppose it's also about the the World Health Organization's broader role and you know how important countries um, see this institution that is really sort of a guidance setting institution, and you know they recently have pushed forward on guidance on digital health, on artificial intelligence as well. So, you know, they, they're trying to sort of um, ensure that they are relevant to the, you know, to the, the current world that we're living in and, and ensure that they provide guidance on, on global health issues. Obviously, you know, whether they take an increasing role on um, obesity drugs in the form of, you know, sort of 
commenting on their um, the, the the price of the drugs and and also ensuring that countries potentially include these drugs in the list of um, essential medicines is also something that you know we'll be watching for not necessarily at this upcoming uh, World Health Assembly but in the coming months you know more broadly at the at, at the WHO. Thanks to our health reporter, Ashley Furlong. I'm Stephen Carroll in London. You can catch us every weekday morning here for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, beginning at 6am in London and 1am on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Stephen. And coming up on Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend, a look ahead to a trilateral summit with China, Japan and South Korea. I'm Tom Busby and this is Bloomberg. I'm Tom Busby in New York with your global look ahead at the top stories for investors in the coming week. We look ahead now to a trilateral meeting between China, Japan and South Korea. The two-day summit may be seen as an opportunity for Japan and South Korea to manage their relationship with China. For more, let's go to Hong Kong and Bloomberg Daybreak Asia hosts Brian Curtis and Doug Krisner. Tom, the talks are expected to cover a range of issues from trade and economic policy to geopolitics and peace and security. And these discussions will be happening at a high level. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol and Chinese Premier Lee Chung will attend. And the summit will be the first major test on the diplomatic front for President Yoon. He's trying to maintain momentum for the remaining three years of his term. Last month, Yoon suffered a major defeat in South Korean parliamentary elections. From the China perspective, Beijing is likely looking to hamper strengthening American ties with both Tokyo and Seoul. And we spoke earlier with Einar Tangen, senior fellow at the Taihe Institute. I asked him about the role of the U.S., in relations with these three countries. If uh, Washington feels uh, strongly that they have to contain China and that's the only thing uh, that works for them, they're gonna put as much pressure as they can on allies uh, to kind of toe the line. Um, but you know, right now things, despite uh, the way that things look in the US, you, know, you have positive numbers, but you have a lot of unhappy people. And that could mean political change. A lot of people are wondering if Trump was going to be in and how that will impact this kind of uh, relationship, especially in Asia. It's not clear how he wants to treat it. In the past, he, you know, he dallied with uh, North Korea. Obviously, that's still an issue there. I don't know that uh, Young Kim is going to deal with him again. I think he felt humiliated by that. So there's got to be some other way of dealing with a nuclearized North Korea, hopefully not one that involves a nuclear arms race uh, throughout Asia. So Japan and South Korea have moved a lot closer to Washington in recent years. But if you look at this relationship going back a long period of time, there are not so many things that China and South Korea agree on except for, uh, you know, very bad feelings uh, that stretch all the way back to the Second World War about Japan. Yeah, and, you know, and I, I don't think that's useful. I mean, looking back uh, at the past is not going to change the present. It can certainly sour it. Uh, but, you know, look at South Korea. It's um, grew 1.3 percent quarter quarter last uh, time, um, much higher than they expected. They were only expecting 0.5. And, you know, exports are 42 percent of gross domestic product. Uh, in Japan, it's about tw- uh, around 21 percent, depending on the year you're looking at. Uh, so it's a slightly different position but both need exports. And uh, right now with, you know, the mean streets coming uh, in terms of economic activity, um, these countries have to keep a practical eye out for jobs, uh, you know, the questions about inflation. And as I said, you know, these are two leaders who desperately need some wins. Uh, You'll note that Xi Jinping is not going. He's sending his uh, premier uh, to deal with this. Uh, But the two leaders are going there, obviously trying to bolster their leadership credentials. So they're in a slightly weaker position. uh, But China so far hasn't been putting the screws to them. They just said, look, let's trade. Einer, as you know, each of these three countries are heavily reliant on the importation of crude oil to power their energy needs. And I'm wondering whether you consider the amount of Iranian crude oil entering China or whether we're talking about the degree to which sanctions have limited the exportation of oil out of Russia. I'm wondering, is there a commonality here when it comes to the topic of energy? 
Well, there is. I mean, there's. it's not much talked about, but both uh, South Korea and, and Japan are still getting Russian oil and gas and things like this. Uh, um, they're, they're not willing to sacrifice their economies the way that Germany was uh, by cutting off uh, the, the cheap gas that was coming in. Um, and, you know, they're, they're going to take a kind of um, a realistic look at this. Uh, China, on the other hand, has a slightly different situation. I mean, everyone talks about China somehow blockading the uh, South China Seas or Taiwan Straits. You know, I, I don't put much credence in that because that would cut off 80% of their oil imports just and you know, 40% of their economy because they wouldn't be able to send things out. It, it's not uh, very practical. Um, you know, you'd be slicing your own throat to, to make a point. Uh, not 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 something that uh, a very pragmatic China is, is going to do. So this issue about uh, access to oil, at least on that part, is not going to be an issue. Uh, the Houthis, uh, Red Sea, that affects some of it. But you're seeing that oil is fungible. It kind of moves uh, from market to market. You know, for instance, India is now the largest purchaser of Russian oil, which eventually makes it way where to Europe, unfortunately, at a higher cost, which is adding to inflation and also affecting competitiveness of uh, industries there that are reliant on energy. He is uh, Einar Tongen from the Taiha Institute, speaking with us earlier on uh, Daybreak Asia. Now let's bring in John Herskovitz, Bloomberg East Asia government editor, who joins us uh, from the Japanese capital. So a two-day summit in Seoul, John. It's high level, Japan, South Korea, China, all involved. Typically, when meetings like this happen at high levels, there are deliverables. Should we be looking at specific areas where we would most likely see some sort of agreement? Well, I think that the main thing for this is that they're actually meeting. The last time that they did, that they did this was 2019, and there have been so many changes in Asia in that time, in the global economy in that time. But we're going to see some deliverables. We've had some talk about like um, discussing trade, people-to-people -people exchanges, um, looking at some sort of joint statement for cooperation. But I don't think we're going to get anything really in the nitty gritty, anything significant, but we'll, we're going to get something, some some sort of uh, statement, some sorts of agreements that are going to show that there's progress, that this meeting resulted in something. John, we heard from Einar Tangan earlier about uh, supposed pressure. I'm curious, is the U.S. putting pressure on Japan and South Korea here to confront China, or is this is this happening organically? I'd, yeah, the U.S. is uh, supporting both Japan and South Korea in having talks with China. I don't think I mean, the pressure that has come on Tokyo and Seoul has been to cooperate with Biden, initi Biden administration initiatives on things like um, exports of high tech to uh, China, tech, uh, chip technology, uh, things that are trying to keep the uh, U.S. A preeminence and its partners' preeminence in uh, high-tech gear and equipment. In terms of like actual pressure for confronting China, I don't think that we're going to find that specifically in the meeting, but the U.S. is such a concerned party that what they have to say will probably have been convened many times over to both Tokyo and Seoul before they have this sit-down with the uh, premier of China. We know that both South Korea and Japan have or are supporting the U.S. export controls when it comes to high-end semiconductor manufacturing into uh, equipment into China. These countries are so dependent on trade with China. Is there a way that they can kind of embrace that relationship, and I'm talking about the Chinese relationship with both Japan and South Korea, without allowing this, this high-tech issue to kind of enter into the conversation, or do you think that's going to be central? Uh, it, and it's a balancing act that Japan and uh, South Korea have had for years, decades, that the, their biggest trading partner has both been China and their biggest security partner is the U.S. So they've found ways to work both sides to keep the trade with China on as even a keel as possible and keep its relationship with the U.S. Uh, strong. But what we've seen in recent years is that the pace of investment from Japan and South Korea into China has slowed and trade with the U.S. has picked up. So we're seeing incentives for uh, Japanese companies, South Korean companies in various states to move in, set up facilities, and we're seeing more and more of this investment coming. And the importance of China, I mean, China still dominates the trade for these two countries, but it's been slightly diminishing over the past uh, couple of years. 
So trade is obviously very central to these talks. What about concern about North Korea and its military cooperation with Russia? Yes, yeah, I mean, we're seeing uh, the, the Japan, South Korea has been in lockstep with the U.S. in their concerns about North Korea. They've all made the allegations of North Korea sending arms to Russia, um, millions of rounds of munitions, missiles, and the government of the U.S. has um, shown satellite pictures of these transfers of equipment from North Korea into Russia, showing trains going over to uh, the front lines near Ukraine. But China has asked for a bit more measured tone. They've said the uh, the burden for a, a peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula should lie with the U.S. and its partners. But China is North Korea's biggest economic benefactor for years and years. Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo would all like to see China play a greater role in reining in Kim Jong-un and his nuclear ambitions. And this will be a part of the conversation, but this has been an ongoing conversation. So I don't think we're going to see huge amounts of headway when it comes to North Korea. When I think about the politics of the APAC region and I think about where that intersects trade, I think of the South China Sea. This is obviously going to be up for discussion, is it not? I believe so. I mean, Japan, more so than South Korea, has expressed its concerns about uh, what it sees as Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea. Uh, South Korea has been a little bit more um, uh, tepid in its statements regarding the issue. And this will be a subject of concern. But also China has its concerns with the Yellow Sea. It has a great deal of its naval forces in the Yellow Sea where the U.S. and South Korea could exert its naval influence and, in theory, bottle up a lot of Chinese naval forces. So there's there's a little bit of um, China has its attention in some areas. The South China Sea is a huge issue as well. The Yellow Sea may come into focus. It's been a subject of China's concerns for a bit. We have to remember it was not that long ago that China whipped up the nationalistic fervor in boycotting uh, various products from both Japan and South Korea. I think uh, none of these countries is an easy partner of any of the others. Exactly. The nationalist fervor can get whipped up from time to time. We're seeing it uh, a bit with um, Japan's discharge of treated water from the Fukushima nuclear reactor. Uh, This is from the uh, 2011 tsunami and nuclear disaster. Japan is going to see if it can raise the issue of Chinese bans of imports of some of its food products, seafood products, related to the Fukushima disaster. But there are sentiments dating back into history which do get uh, stoked for political purposes. The ones between Japan and South Korea have cooled down a little bit, but um, the Fukushima incident is something that is of concern in South Korea and even more so in China. John, thank you so much for joining us and helping us set up this two-day summit that will be taking place in Seoul in the week ahead, where top officials from Japan, South Korea, and China will be meeting. He is John Herskovitz, uh, Bloomberg East Asia government editor. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself weekdays here for Daybreak Asia, beginning at 8 a.m. in Hong Kong, 8 p.m. on Wall Street. Tom? Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Brian. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Daybreak Weekend. Join us again Monday morning at 5 a.m. Wall Street time for the latest on markets overseas and the news you need to start your day. I'm Tom Busby. Stay with us. Top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.